Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to just once again come and worship you. We thank you for your son Jesus, what he did for us on Calvary. We thank you, Lord, for just uh, allow me to serve you and to just preach your word. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for those uh, that are wondering why I'm here, you can see the beginning of my video that I had sermon that I had this morning on freedom and liberty come from God and you can get a little explanation of why I'm preaching here instead of from the the church I'm not going to get into it all again now but uh, just watch the beginning of that and, and you'll you'll know the reason why but tonight or we're going to continue on with uh, this would be part six of the inspired King James Bible compared to the modern corrupt Bibles now, last week uh, I had left off and I was talking about how the Bible publishers, it's all about making the money and they have all the different bi individual Bibles and so forth. And I had mentioned that there's a verse about them merchandising it. Well, I wanted to go ahead and read that before we move on. So turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. So 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And through covetousness shall there with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. But basically it says, you know, with feigned words make merchandise of you. You know, they're, they're using you to take advantage of you that, that, to keep buying the new Bibles. That, that uh, you know, it's all money for them, but they're, they're treating you as, as a way to... Uh, you know, make you buy all their merchandise and sales. Now, many of the translators uh, on the modern Bibles are on the translating committee of multiple Bibles. This shows they do not really believe or trust in the Bible they translated, but rather translating Bibles is just a job to them and a way to make money. If it was not, and they really believed in their work and that it was God's word, then they would not translate another Bible or keep updating the first one and they would be an NIV only person or whatever translation they worked on. They are also admitting they do not agree with their translation from an earlier Bible since they change it in the new Bible they are working on. They are all just a bunch of frauds. You know, as I said, it's just all about money, you know, otherwise you want to keep being on the same translate and all these different translating committees. Now, many of the translators on the modern Bibles are on the translating uh, committees, as I said, of multiple Bibles. And as I said, this shows they do not believe or trust in the Bible they translate, but rather, sorry, anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's a duplicate, sorry. Um, moving on, Peter, uh, sorry, Pastor S. Franklin Logston was a friend of F. Dewey Lockman, who convinced him to publish the New American Standard Bible. Now, Logston got the translators for the new Bible and oversaw the new translation. Years later, after he had been around for a while, God convicted him of his sins and he repented and began blasting the NASB and told churches to return and stay with the blessed King James Bible as only it was the Word of God. Now, he was worried he would lose his salvation for having subtracted from the Word of God as warned in Revelation by creating the New American Standard Bible. If you would, turn to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. So, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Okay, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now he said, just speaking of... Um, this pastor uh, Logston, that the, so many deletions 
from uh, found in the NSB could only come from Satan. Now, how, how ironic that in the very book that says not to add or take away from God's word, modern Bibles have made more changes to the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. Now, this man, unlike most involved in the corrupt Bibles, saw the light and realized he had changed and messed with God's word is found in the inspired King James Bible. We can only pray that more of those involved in the modern corrupt Bibles will repent. You know, and part of it, his thing was he was shown stuff by, uh, you know, people like myself to try to expose it and so forth. And, you know, eventually, you know, he was convicted by God. But, you know, the sad truth is that most of the people that are involved in these new corrupt Bibles, they, they never are. Now, most modern Bibles use American English rather than British English as found in the King James Bible and used by most of the English speakers of the world. Americans think they're the only people on the earth and everything revolves around them. Now, this is even seen in how some Bibles even have the name American in them, such as the American Standard Version, that's the ASV, and American Translation, the New American Standard Bible, the NASB that I was just talking about, and the Roman Catholic New American Bible. Now, except for the United States, the rest of the world uses British English due to its spread by the British Empire. Now, Scripture is meant to be for all people and not just Americans, which is why it must be written in British English with British English spellings. The King James Bible is the only true international Bible. One example of how Americans think everyone must spell like them is the true story of an American missionary in India, I believe is where it was, I can't remember exactly, but I, I believe it was India, who was teaching English and all of the children spelled music, which American spells M-U-S-I-C, but these children all spelt it as M-U-S-I-C-K, just like in the King James Bible. He kept marking the children wrong and tried to correct them until his arrogance was corrected by parents and other educators and it was shown that English-speaking people throughout the world spell it with the K just like in the King James Bible and not like Americans. Americans need to educate themselves before they try forcing their way on others. Now changing spelling could affect a possible equidistant letter sequence pattern that I've spoken before about that might possibly be in the King James Bible. This is also why numbers should be written out as well, such as they are in the King James Bible, rather than using Arabic numerals. Using Arabic numerals also destroys the number patterns found in Scripture by removing the word. You know, if you just actually have the actual number uh, 13 or something versus the word 13, then it destroys the number pattern as well. Now, these are some of the reasons that God commanded the Israelites that they were not to add or remove from his word, as by doing so it also destroys the patterns he has in scripture. If you would, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. So Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now when the King James Bible first came out in 1611, this period was known as early modern English. The King James Bible helped standardize modern English that we have today, including the spelling from Middle English. You know, originally, you know, English broke it down. You had your Old English, Middle English, and what you refer to as Modern English. And it was the King James Bible that helped set the standard for what we now have as Modern English versus the translation, you know, from the, the Middle English. You know, if you were to look at Old English, it would be like looking at a foreign language. You know, so it, it's something completely different. But the uh, King James Bible, as I said, uh, set the standards for what we use today. And the King James Bible spelling was standardized in 1769, which brought us into the modern English. 
you know, that it was set, you know, and when it first came out, it was set the stage to move us into the modern English. And then today we have, that's what we have, you know, today. Now, the use of British English also helps people have English as a second language, as oftentimes they will be able to recognize a word that is similar to a word in their language. The British theater, T-H-E-A-T-R-E, -E, is the same spelling in French, and that's what's found in the King James Bible. The E-A-T-R in the middle of the word can be found in the Spanish and Italian word. The French has the same U-R ending on it as the King, uh, King James Bible. Favor, you know, which is F-A-B-O-R, O-U-R. Valor, O-U-R ending. Honor, O-U-R ending. And of course, Savior, O-U-R ending. The French word for Savior even has seven letters as in the King James Bible. Modern Bibles change Savior, which is in the King James Bible, seven letters, S-A-V-I-O-U-R. To six letters, they take out the U and make it only six letters. Six is the number of man, and seven is the number of completeness, with Jesus being the full completeness. Now, the King James Bible retains the British meanings of words that can still be seen over in the United Kingdom today that are lost in modern Bibles that try to Americanize the meaning. Now, one example is the use of the word let, L E T. In, in, for example, places like Matthew chapter 21, verse 33, or Matthew chapter 21, verse 41. Let, let's just go ahead and read those so that you know what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. So Matthew chapter 21, and verse 33. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. See that word let and let it out to, a, to husband and husbandmen and went into a far country. And then go down to verse 41. We'll see it again. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Now, let in these verses means to lease or, or rent out. You know, it, it means you're, you're leasing it out to them so that, you know, like farmers do that around here. Sometimes they'll lease out that land and let other farmers use it. And then they get, you know, some, uh, <clears throat> still some money from, from that other farmer or so forth. You know, they lease it out to them. You know, or like you rent out a, an apartment or something like that, at least out an apartment. Now, this same term, let, is still used in Great Britain today when someone goes to rent a house or apartment so it is easily understood. You know, if you read the context of that, you can clearly see what they're referring to and let it out to husband. In other words, they're leasing it out to these people and so forth. It's clearly understood. And, and people over Great Britain still use that term today, as I said, when they go to rent. Or lease some property so they clearly understand what what that word means you know we don't need to change it just because ignorant Americans that uh, don't want to learn anything we have to dumbify it just to make Americans understand it now pilcros are markings which identify where a new paragraph starts a pilcro is a backwards double line P with the P filled in black so basically, it looks like a P that's backwards, and then it'll have another line next to it. So it's like two straight lines, but the, the first one on the left would be like a backwards P, and then the, the P part, the circle part of the P would be filled in black. Now, that's called a pill crow, and that, that signifies the start of a paragraph. Now, modern Bibles remove this, and it even has been removed in many King James Bibles by the Bible publishers. Most modern Bibles have the verses run together in paragraph form, and it can often be hard to find a verse. You know, if you look in most Bibles, other than King James and a few others, then most of them, they'll all just be run together, and then the verse number will be right in the middle of the, the paragraph or something. So you're trying to find, you know, verse 13 or 12 or 11 or whatever, and you're like, where is this thing? And it'll be on small print, and you're trying to find it. Where, you know, the King James Bible has each verse in individually as a separate thing. 
And then it has the, the paragraph where God ordains the paragraphs, not where man decides to put them. But like I said, unfortunately, a lot of those same corrupt publishers were even trying to bring in this corruption into the King James Bible, and they'll take out the, the pilcrows and so forth. The King James Bible is made easy for children to find, as well as for studying by placing each verse on a separate line. You know, as I said, it makes it so much easier when you're trying to find a verse, and especially if you've got a young child, you're trying to teach the Word of God, and you tell them to go and look up a verse, it's clearly there. You can see, you know, it's something, whatever, Romans 3, 23, you go try to find it, and it's clearly there. Where these other Bibles are searching all over, and then half the time things missing, and then you know, they don't even put the numbers, and they put them off. Or sometimes, well, even worse, they'll have them off on the side, and then they'll have a little dot maybe where the new verse starts in the middle of that sentence or something, and you're supposed to figure out, and they'll have two verse numbers there, like 22 and 23, and in the middle of that paragraph will be a little dot or something that that second after that dot would be the verse 23 starts so you're trying to figure all this out and it's very confusing and you know especially for a young child or somebody that's not you know it's just a, a new christian you know it's just god's word is made to be simple for even children to understand now god has a built-in dictionary within the king james bible that will not be found in any modern bibles god will oftentimes define his harder words with a more common, simpler word. This may be found in the same verse, or it may be found in a nearby verse, or at least the same chapter. Most of the time, you know, it's, it's found fairly, fairly close, but sometimes God does make you search a little harder as he wants his children to study scripture rather than just read it. You know, God doesn't want to hand everything to us on a silver platter. He wants us to study his word. So sometimes you may have to actually find it that, the equivalent of it in another book even or, or something you know it's it's you know but most of the time they're like i said it can be in the same verse same chapter at least same book or something but you know sometimes god does want us to to search a little bit harder and it's not going to just give everything to us on a silver platter now one example is a person may not know what the word deceased means but god tells us it means dead Go to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 14. So Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 14. Okay, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 14. They are dead. They sh shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. So we see it says they are dead. And then he tells you they are deceased. And in between there it says they shall not live. So in other words, he's telling you even what dead and deceased mean. If you know, it tells you that dead and deceased mean the same thing. And then if you don't even know what dead or deceased means, he tells you they are not, you know, they're not alive. You know, they shall not live. In other words, you know, they're, they're, they're not, not living. They're dead. They're seized. Now, God shows you that long-suffering means patience in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. So, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, let's turn there and look at this example. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So we see they're, they're, they're right next to each other. All he separates them with is just the word and. You know, that, that happens a lot in Scripture. He'll do something that would literally tell you basically immediately what that word means. So if you don't understand one, you understand, you know, Hopefully you'll understand the other word. So we see patience means long-suffering. Long-suffering means patience. Now, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Turn there. We'll see where it defines forthwith as meaning immediately. So Acts chapter 9, verse 18. We're going to see that forthwith means immediately. So Acts chapter 9, verse 18. 
And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So it says immediately there fell before his eyes as he had scales. So, the, you know, immediately those scales were removed, and then immediately it says, you know, received his sight forthwith. So, again, now he also got his sight immediately. So it's telling you that immediately it means forthwith, and forthwith means immediately. Now, many tried to say the word forthwith is archaic, as are many other words in the King James Bible. But archaic to who? The word forthwith is used every day by the New York City Police Department, the NYPD, and the New York City Fire Department, the FDNY, on their radio, such as the NYPD would say, quote, send me a bus forthwith, meaning to send an ambulance immediately as it is an urgent matter. So they're telling you, it says, you know, send it forthwith. And they'll, if you listen to them, they use that every single day. So it is not archaic. So again, archaic to who? You know, they definitely do not think forthwith is archaic. The NYPD for sure. Now for those less common used words, they could quickly become a part of our language in one generation if we just teach them to our children. Other words, such as the word defense in the King James Bible, is changed in modern Bibles to defense. In other words, the King James Bible spells it D-E-F-E-N-C-E, -E -E, and American English spells it D-E-F-E-N-S-E. -E -E. Now, before I move on to that, I want to say that, you know, when I was talking about the archaic language, that, like I said, if we would just learn to teach these things to people, you know, anything's going to become archaic if you stop using it. It just it doesn't take very long to quickly learn that, oh, well, forthwith means immediately. Okay, how, how hard was that? I explained it to you. I'll show you an example. And then, you know, very quickly we can start learning some of these things if you just, you know, take the time to look something up. But most, most people, especially Americans, are so lazy they, don't, they can't even look in a dictionary or do something. And now we have these smartphones. You can even just ask your phone what it is if you don't know. So... You know, there's really no excuse for people to have these so-called archaic words. And what I'm going to get into at a later on time, and we'll see that some of these so-called archaic words that they claim are in the, in the King James Bible, there's many words, archaic words, that are used in the modern Bibles as well. So don't think it's just, quote, the, the King James Bible that has what, they, what they, they think are archaic words. When I just showed you, for example, the fourth width is not an archaic word. But as I said, that um, some of the, the words in the King James Bible, you know, have the, um, you know, they, they change the spelling, you know, from British to American English. Now, this removes, like in this example here, defense, as I, sh I, I mentioned, it removes God's built-in dictionary with the word fence built into the word. So the word defense in British, D-E-F-E-N-C-E, -E, has the word fence built right in the word. Now for defense, we oftentimes build a fence or wall around us. Now changing it to American spelling makes the connection harder to see. You know, there's no such word as a, a fence with the S, you know, that you don't see that word fence or a wall or something like that being built around. So, you know, again, if you didn't understand some child or whoever, somebody new to English, didn't understand what the word defense meant. Well, they can figure it out by seeing the word fence. If they know the word fence, they know, okay, well, it's it, it meaning build a fence or something around something. And now this is also seen in a word such as brazen, B-R-A-S-E-N, which is changed in modern Bibles to brazen, B-R-A-Z-E-N, which removes the built-in word brass, showing the meaning that the object is made of brass. We make brass objects, not braze objects. So again, you know, sometimes the meaning of the word can be defined just by, you know, can be defined by just the spelling of it. That you know that this is a, 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 an object made out of brass, for example. Now the 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary me, got many of its definitions from the King James Bible as God determined what the English word meant. Now, a couple of good books on God's built-in dictionary in the King James Bible are the King James Bible Built-in Dictionary by Barry Goddard, 
and the Dictionary Inside the King James Bible by Dr. Gail Ripplinger. Now, if we learn to also pronounce words properly, then God gives us the meaning. One example is the word cunny, C-O-N-E-Y, and it's pronounced cunny. It's not coney, it's pronounced, the proper uh, way to pronounce it is cunny. Now, that rhymes with bunny, which is exactly what it is. Now, a coney is a, or cunny, see, as I said, people, you say it wrong, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a cunny, is a rabbit, and the King James built-in dictionary verifies this with the comparison to hare in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. So we see that, that the built-in dictionary turned to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. We see that the, the built-in dictionary verifies God's word, or not only how, if you pronounce the word properly, but then you can figure out what this animal is. But God's built-in dictionary also confirms it. So Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 7. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof, as the camel, and the hare, and the cunny, for they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean unto you. So we see right here, you had the hare and the cunny right next to each other. So if you didn't understand, you could see, you know, see that, you know, that, um, you know, rabbit and hare, are, you know, very similar. Now, the 1828 Webster Dictionary also agrees with God's word that a cunny is a rabbit. Now, modern Bibles give the wrong animal and destroy the built-in dictionary of God. Many Bibles use such words as rock hyrax or rock badger, which are not only harder words, but the wrong animal. You know, how many people know what a rock badger is or a rock hyrax or whatever? And, you know, now it's like harder words, but as I said, they're, they're not even the same animal. You know, so it, it destroys how I just showed you the comparison of how that hair and, and the Cunny are, are related. You know, they're the same animal. Now, follow God's example in the King James Bible. Do not make these changes that are being made or others that I have and will mention. You know, there, there's so many of these little subtle changes that are being made. And, you know, people might think it's no big deal, but it is a big deal. I mean, just like this, number one, they're not even translating God's word right. They can't even get the animal right. So how are they supposed to get things about salvation right? Now, the King James Bible also uses many common words such as penny, farthing, and pound, which are known by people of the former British Empire. Now, the United Kingdom and some other former English colonies still use the name penny and pound for a coin. You know, a penny being their small denomination and the pound being like our dollar. Or but even here in the United States of America, we normally call our cent a penny so even americans understand the meaning of the word you know you go to the, i mean i went to the bank one day and i said hey i need a roll of cents huh they looked at me like i had, i said it again they, they're like all confused i said can i have a roll of pennies oh okay you know i mean they work in the bank and they don't even know that our coin is actually called a cent it is not a penny but americans always call it a penny just showing you because we're you know, originally came from the british empire as well so, you know, it shows you people understand what a penny is. So we do not need to change that in God's word. But modern Bibles change penny to denarius, including the New King James Version, which claims to be an update of the King James Bible. You know, again, they claim they just changed like the these and the thous and that type of stuff. Well, again, here's one change they made. And how is that an update? I just explained to you. We all know what a penny is. Who knows what a denarius is? Now, not only is denarius a harder word, as well as containing more syllables, it is not even a translated word. So again, how is this an update? You know, and again, why are these people never translating some of these words? You know, they're, that's what they're getting paid to do, to translate these words then. Translate is what it is. It's a penny. Now, others use such words as a day's wage. Well, how much is that? 
a billionaire or CEO of a company has a much greater day's wage than me or most people. Even poor Americans have a greater day's wage than most of the rest of the world. A person in Haiti will have much less than us, so the use of a day's wage has no meaning, whereas penny does. You know, they always say, well, you know, there was a penny was how much they made in a day. Well, then leave it as penny. Again, like I said, a day's wage is very relevant. A major league baseball player makes a whole lot more in a day's time than what I do. So, you know, their day's wage is not comparable to, you know, most common folks or something. So, you know, just leave it what it is instead of trying to guess. I mean, and it's just going to also going to change, you know, 30 years from now, a day's wage is not going to be the same as it was even, you know, 30 years from, you know, from today, you know, back in the past. But now pound is changed in many modern Bibles to minna, including in the New King James Version, the NIV or the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the ESV, and the pre-mentioned uh, New American Standard Bible, the NASB. Now most modern Bibles change ass to donkey, where donkey is an American word and also has more syllables, making for a harder word. Now, again, maybe the, the, the Bible is meant for even children to read, and the more syllables you have, the harder a word is to pronounce and learn. There are other words that modern Bibles fail to translate, making it harder for the reader to understand. But I mean, we see just even simple things like this, that, that you know, when the rest of the world, English-speaking world, uses ass, donkey is an American thing. Again, this is supposed to be for the whole world, not just for the uh, Americans. But, you know, as I said, a lot of these modern Bibles fail to translate many words besides such as like denarius and others, making it harder to understand. Now, this includes leaving hell untranslated with Sheol or Hades in many Bibles. You know, Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades in the Greek and New Testament. Or Tartarus is found in the New American Bible or the um, Home and Christian Standard Bible. They use that in 2 Peter 2.4. Uh, Revised New Jerusalem Bible, that's the RNJB, that's another Roman Catholic Bible, and the, as I said, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. You know, here are just a few examples. Of course, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, that's the Southern Baptist one. Again, this, as I said, I, I point that out because it's such a big denomination and, and, and it's just dangerous. You know, it shows how corrupt they are. Now, here are just a few examples of harder words found in modern Bibles compared to the easier King James Bible word. The New King James Version has Gad, G-A-D, for the King James Bible, Go, in Jeremiah 31, verse 22. It has Sistrums for Cornet in 2 Samuel 6, 5. Terebinth for Oak in Isaiah 1, 30. Curds for butter in Deuteronomy 32, verse 14, and many more. I mean, there's, I'm just giving you a few examples. I, mean, I could go on forever. But the NIV, the New, uh, New International Version, New International Perversion, the Non-Inspired Version, whatever you want to call it, has Goim, G-O-I-I-M, or G-O-Y-I-M in the 2011 edition, for nations in Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. Negev for south in Genesis chapter 12, verse 9. Nephilim for giants in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Nubians, or well, they changed it to Cushites in 2011 edition, for Ethiopians in Daniel 11, chapter 43. Pinions for wings in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. The 19, that's the 1984 edition. Sat traps, so see, even in our own editions, they keep changing, they can't even keep it from one Bible to the other. But sat traps for their tenants in Esther chapter 3, verse 12. They have wadi for river in Numbers 34, 5, and many more. Then you have the New American Standard Bible has pinions for feathers in Psalm 91, verse 4, pro council for deputy in Acts 13, 8, putrefaction for stink. In Isaiah 3:24, Wadi for valley in Numbers 21 verse 12, 
Magi for wise men in Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Be gone for go in Matthew chapter 8 verse 32. That's the 1977 edition. And many more. Knox version has drovers for pastors in Jeremiah 12.10. I could do the same for all the modern Bibles that claim to be so much easier to read than the King James Bible. You know, I notice, I mean, there's a lot of these two that have some of those same words. I was just trying to get some little bit different ones for some of them. But, you know, they, a lot of them have the same thing in a lot of different verses and so forth. But many of these Bibles, as I said, use the same hard words of some that I've already shown including some of those I already mentioned. They use some in other Bibles, such as Nephilim, Negev, and Satraps, and not just in the Bibles I mentioned them. You know, a lot of the Bibles all have Nephilim for giants and so forth. A good example, like Genesis 6-4. But these words are definitely not easier than the King James Bible. And Nephilim, again, is another one of those untranslated words. You know, how is something that's untranslated an easier word? You know, giants are self-explanatory. You know, there are a few hard words in the King James Bible, but God defines them within Scripture with his built-in dictionary, and sometimes it is necessary to have a harder word to maintain the proper translation and use a biblical word. You know, sometimes just for some particular thing, we need like propitiation or, or something like that, repentance, because it's a biblical word and it has a specific meaning that we can't just change it to, quote, a simpler word. You know, you cannot just use an easier word if it is not even correct. Now, some other harder words found in these Bibles and some other modern Bibles include words such as paraclete for comforter, magpie for babbler, lecherously for abomination, non plused for amazed, or plussed, or how do you pronounce it, tahash for badgers, palanquin for chariot, Mamzer and baseborn for bastard, wadi for brook, chalice for cup, pederas for effeminate, troth for faith, quohileth for the preacher, certus for quickstands, licentious for riotous, blue lapaz lazuli for sapphire, lilith for screech owl, brigands for thieves, strumpet for whore, Holocaust for burnt offering, armlets for chains, bungler for sinner, pyre, P-Y-R-E, for pile, sorel for speckled, zaphon for north, brood for seed, quadrants for farthing, amulets for earrings, imbibe for drink, cores for measures, mantelet for defense, torrent for river, Breakers for waves, ramparts for tower, diadem for crown, and vassal for servant. And I mean, again, I could keep going on and on and on. I mean, you know, the King James Bible clearly is easier to read, and I could, as I said, list many more words than these. Do not believe the lie that the King James Bible is hard to read. This lie is from Satan to try and keep people from reading the King James Bible, since he knows it is the true word of God and not his false Bibles. This is why he pushes any of his false Bibles as long as they pull people away from the King James Bible. You know, he doesn't care what people read as long as it's not a King James Bible. Now, most people who make the claim that the King James Bible is harder have never even read it or compared it to the Bible they read. You know, as I said, you could find, you know, there's just many, many more examples of words that... You know, I could show you that, you know, they have all kinds of archaic words and so forth and much harder words that, you know, how are those kind of words clearly easier than the King James Bible? But we'll continue this study next week. We'll pick it up and we'll, we'll continue with the study. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time here. Just, uh, you've given us once again to come and study and hear your word. Again, thank you for those that are here. We... Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. We do uh, pray, Lord, that those people that have been turned over to Satan that I spoke about before, that, uh, Lord, that they get convicted, and, and if they're true Christians, they, they turn to you, and if they're not, then they get truly saved. And, and, and Father, just, uh, just pray for that whole situation. And, Father, we just 
uh, as we get ready to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow, we thank you for the freedom and liberties that you have given us, Lord, that we were born in a nation that, at least for a while anyway, we did have all those freedom and liberties that they're trying to take away now to just worship you and, and so forth. And as of right now, we at least still have most of that ability to be able to worship you with, with, in, in freedom. And Father, we do pray and thank you for all those that, that, that gave their lives to allow us to continue to have that freedom. Father, we just um, pray that people remember what tomorrow is all about, that it, it it's not about that satanic Juneteenth day that uh, the Black, oh, Black Lives Matter people and the woke individuals are trying to push, that it's all about uh, the, the true freedom that you gave us, Lord, on that July 4th of 1776, that, that when we proclaim that freedom that, that came from you. And Father, we just thank you again for all that you do. Just keep us safe and healthy and, and to be able to continue to worship you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.